some chips. Okay, everybody. Um, welcome, <laughs> w- welcome back for our very obviously monthly or <laughs> so obviously monthly. <laughs> or, We've been cranking these out <laughs> at, a, yes. <laughs> at a shocking rate. Yes. In case you haven't noticed, we switched over to a record only close to a national holidays model. Uh, so you know Thanksgiving is coming up. Which so. I hear is a great model for content <laughs> yes. creators. Yeah, I'm guessing like the last time we recorded was like around the Fourth of July. Anyway, this something. this episode is all about confidence and success because we're talking yeah. about um, what Jordan Peterson and lobsters teach us about success, defeat, and relationships. That's uh, right. So so we're not gonna talk like defeated lobsters about this. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we've if, emerged from our shells if stronger you could... than ever. That is true. If this were a video podcast, you would notice that we're standing up tall with our shoulders back. And basically like... That's literally not true. I was leaned over, hunched over like a shriveled... (laughs) There we go. Paul's looking very confident now. But we both both did, at least temporarily, did that posture. As if we were, you know, straight out of the military or something. Yeah. I'm guessing you have to do that in the military. I don't know. Yeah. Do they still have to do that nowadays? I, I don't know. Probably. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. we're we're excited to be back. Um, yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, thanks. Welcome good. back, everyone. And, uh, yeah, thanks. we we had a lot of. Uh, I mean, you were stressed and busy. Yeah. Now I'm true. stressed and busy. Yeah, um, I had some changes but, with but, work. But we're trying so. to we're trying to get things back on track. Um, in some ways, this discussion today, at least for me, is going to be a little bit uh, autobiographical. Uh, I feel like uh, I've experienced a lot of what. Jordan Peterson talks about in his book, 12 Rules for Life, Yeah. Um, specifically the first chapter. Uh, I feel like I've experienced a lot of what he talked about uh, in my own life recently, so it should be interesting. Yeah, same here. Um, yeah. You know, actually, when I was thinking about lobsters, for some reason, you know that uh, that old story? It's probably like, uh, it's probably like not true. Uh, but you know the one about uh, how starfish. <laughs> no, well, yeah, <laughs> that was definitely not true. <laughs> starfish is another it's good one. Good message. It's not true. Starfish is another one. Um, no, no, the one with the crabs where you like put crabs in a bucket and you boil them. No, that's oh, the that's frog. frog. Sorry, the fro- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you talk. I, I think the frog one is also definitely not true. Although I will say, I lived in Argentina for two years, and the sh- the showers that we used really was just a can filled with water that had a heating coil inside. Oh, yeah. And ours started to smell really bad one time. And I, and I, I found out later it was because there were some frogs that had <gasps> done it. But I think it was just because there was gross. a lid on it and they couldn't get out. You know? Gross. Yeah, it was gross. But at any rate, um, you no, know, you know, like the one with the crabs. You put the crabs in a, in a bucket and then none of them get out because as soon as one starts to crawl out, the other one pulls it back in. Get back in here, bucko. That's rude. And yeah. They, they and, kill each other. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably untrue but but for some reason when we were kids we we mistakenly thought that they were talking about lobsters and so we would use this analogy like when one of us was like trying to leave someplace or trying to like go exit the conversation to go to bed and the other one would like keep the conversation going like and not let you go Mm -hmm. we would call them a lobster stop being a lobster so that's what you think of of when you think of lobsters yeah kind of i see anyways um a random aside about lobsters. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is not important, for, but I just want everyone to know. <laughs> since I have to tell my latest ailment, right? Sure, that it. my forearms yeah. are really worn uh, out because because uh, <laughs> we helped a friend uh, move this this really heavy couch today. Uh, um, but my my forearms are already worn out because I've been at, at this job I'm working recently. Um, it's it's kind of boring and i'm at the desk all day and uh, i'm having one of those grip strength things that I, I got on amazon thank you amazon your advertising <laughs> revenue is appreciated um and so i'm worn out man <laughs> my forearms but i think um i think they're about to become enormous yeah you, it's pretty much <laughs> overnight i'm expecting you to wake up like popeye <laughs> yeah i'm so, looking forward to that did you ever see the popeye live action movie it was the robin Williams. i didn't know they made that that sounds terrible well just yeah <laughs> it's interesting and the way they made him the way they made his muscles they kind of look like paper mache or something to me i don't know uh-huh. but yeah they were like enormously gigantic uh-huh. forearms uh-huh. And stuff. i that so, is one of my goals is to get huge forearms and yeah well there's nothing that will make you more like a confident lobster that is that. true they're known for their big forearms yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh, at least gigantic claws yeah 
Yeah. So anyway, okay. Um, so uh, twelve rules for life. So so Jordan Peterson. I think we, we've mentioned him a few times here and there. Um, I, I think he's one of the more um, more important cultural voices today. Um, he's a psychotherapist by training and experience. Uh, he teaches at University of Toronto, and I think he previously taught at Harvard. Um, he he's been known to say things which. Uh, which in some cases weren't politically correct, at least for certain um, groups. Uh, but, but he's gained a lot of no- notoriety because he's so smart and so good at debating. And yeah. and his arguments are ultimately pretty darn reasonable. Uh, yeah. for, you know, for the most part, that can be argued. But um, anyway, he says a lot of uh, interesting stuff in his book, 12 Verse for Life. Um, it's funny. It actually, the origin of his book was that he had responded on Quora. Do you know that website? Yeah. Quora. And um, and uh, I, I can't remember what he had responded to. But things, that, you know, things about life and stuff. And um, uh, like the – I can't remember exactly the terminology. But the upvotes or whatever for his posts were like mm. unusually high for a Quora post. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of like where he first realized that um, people – you know, appreciate what he had to say. Hmm. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't read 12 rules for life. Um, but I've listened to a lot of his podcasts. And so a lot of the stuff that, um, a lot of the stuff in the summary here was sounded, um, 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 uh, it was reminding me of stuff that I've heard on his podcast. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and he says a lot of practical, uh, reasoned, uh, and well-researched stuff that that have value for people, um, you know, particularly for people who feel. I, I mean, the the subtitle of his book is an antidote to chaos, and and uh, you know, yeah. a, a lot of what he says appeals to uh, so many people. I mean, he's he's a New York Times bestseller, um, but but people who you know kind of feel disempowered or like they're drowning in life, and and yeah. has some messages that, that aren't just like cushy feel good stuff that make you feel good for a day and <laughs> and then nothing changes in your life which a lot of you know a lot of people in his field that is what they offer um yeah so yeah he's um he's i feel like he's only he's most of thank com- you jordan peterson yeah for <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> for paying us just kidding we yeah, haven't no, received no, any of the money from you. anyone go no, ahead no, for sure no <laughs> not just jordan peterson there's yeah. no one that has sent us any money yeah. um but uh, yeah, I, I think it's kind of funny that he's been kind of controversial because I feel like he's only controversial mostly because he's he has been like misconstrued um, and kind of things have been taken way out of context. And well, I think that's part of it. But a lot of his conclusions are just flat out unpalatable for for certain people with with a certain ideological yeah. uh, bent. Um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That that's fair. Um, there's been some of both, you know, because sure. Like, oh, of course. New York Times. I remember there was a New York Times article. There was a lady that interviewed him. Yeah, I don't think the New York Times likes that he's been as successful as he has. No, they don't yeah. like it. The BBC doesn't. Like, yeah. Um, which it's, it's unfortunate. It's it 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 made me lose a little bit of respect for them for supposedly objective reporting. Like, right. it, You know, the lady on the BBC that had interviewed him, that really tried tripping him up. You know, where then they had all these memes like. He was saying, I don't remember, but they had these really fun, funny ones where it was like, um, I don't remember, there was one about a cat. Do you remember what it was? I don't know. I, I don't know. But, I don't remember. But, but it's true. So. So, I, I mean, it's not It's not that his arguments are so airtight that there couldn't be a reasonable like counter argument. But often, at least in these highly publicized uh, like, you know, interviews he's had with people like the interviewer, if the interviewer doesn't like them, they're just not well equipped to to – to debate him <laughs> like they they yeah. resort to all the uh, all the weak counter arguments and 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 a lot of um, times they probably haven't actually like listened to much of his stuff yeah that that's clear like yeah. i heard there was one that i was watching that was like some some lady was like yelling at him he, i don't remember where he was at and she was like saying something about how he supported nazis and stuff and why wouldn't he disavow them or something because there were some neo-nazis that I don't remember. It was like they were saying that some of them liked his message or something. Sure. Like, um, yeah, and neo Nazis message... eat food, and so do I. Yeah, <gasps> exactly. Right. And and he said, "You want to disavow? Okay, I'll give you disavow. I, I don't support neo Nazis at all. I don't, yeah. And 
and but still she like yelled something stupid at him and yeah. whatever it was like but she clearly hadn't by the way we don't we disavow neo-nazis as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> let's, <laughs> absolutely let's nip that in the butt <laughs> <laughs> that is true <laughs> Although Bryce did call me Hitler the other day, I can't. Remember. Oh sure, well you know what bigger insult and what more apropos uh, insult can you give than to declare someone Hitler? Yeah, I can't remember what the context was, and I did recently buy the game Secret Hitler. I've never played yeah. it, but I'm going to spend some time yeah. with family, and I needed a yeah. game that plays a lot of people. Anyway, At any rate, we're, we're totally we're both interrupting your yeah, original thought. I know, but. I don't remember what my original thought was. Okay. No, it wasn't. Well, I think the we record got will show that it. it was something. And after we listen to this, I think, we'll I, think I was just saying that, like, you know, if you listen to like a lot of his stuff, you li- realize that, like, it's just a lot of really reasonable stuff about, like, hey, go, go be responsible and yeah. do good stuff yeah, to get of, your life in a better place. That's right. Like, one that's of his really rules is, is clean up your room. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he We're, uses the word bucko a lot. <laughs> and, and there was, I couldn't find it actually, but. There was um in one of his uh, lectures he was laughing about how somebody had made a t-shirt with something something with a lobster on it I don't remember and I think it said bucko on it <laughs> on the shirt because he talks about these lobsters and cleaning up your room and he uses the word bucko sometimes yeah his, he he's got kind of a very interesting character uh, sure. yeah all right so anyway so you're probably wondering what the heck are you guys talking about with these lobsters um. And it's funny, like, so in chapter one of, of 12 Rules for Life, he talks about, um, well, okay, so the, the chapter title is uh, Stand Up Straight With Your Shoulders Back. Um, and he, he early on, he talks about uh, lobsters, which uh, have been on the earth for millions of years, uh, longer than most forms of life. Yeah, older than trees. Yeah. Um, and, and he... I mean, the whole, well, (laughs) so he kind of talks about how lobsters uh, compete for territory, especially when they're molting and their their shells are soft, so they're vulnerable. So they have to compete for for real estate, for places to hide, and there's just not enough places. So so he says that, you know, naturally they, um, you know, as they compete for scarce resources, they form these dominance hierarchies. Um, which have to do not just with, not just with, you know, their habitat, you know, where they live, but also, uh, which, which, uh, you know, for males, which female lobsters will, will mate with them, uh, you know, food, so that kind of thing. So basically he says that, uh, the lobsters, which can defend their turf most successfully are the ones that end up at the top of this hierarchy and they get the best stuff, the best, uh, the best mates the best real estate the best food um and that yeah basically they get all the mates like it's it oh right right how, like it's exponentially more worthwhile to be successful that's Which right why you're, you're very aggressive um uh, because you're like it's it's all or nothing really like yeah you have nothing to lose i mean well you could die i guess yeah but yeah you know if you win you get like everything get all the goods that's right and and he naturally he relates that to human beings as well that um you know we're competing you know not not always in the same you know physical sense but we're competing for resources uh for opportunities uh you know for the good for the good neighborhoods for the you know the best mates uh for the best jobs and um it basically um that's something you see in in the animal world as well as the human world and and then he talks about um lobster's response to to being defeated he says that you know about half the well i can't remember exactly how often but it's such a big deal if two lobsters get in a fight um because they could die you know and even if they don't die if if one is badly beaten uh especially if it had a higher position before then it's brain brain (laughs) it's brain literally like reforms and um and in particular uh it's balance of of two neurochemicals uh shifts dramatically so it's serotonin and it's octopamine um and uh he he, he describes it in, <laughs> uh, so a lobster with high serotonin and, and low octopamine is the one that is a victorious lobster and then the reverse for a defeated lobster so the way he describes it is that a lobster with high serotonin and low octopamine is a cocky strutting sort of shellfish much less likely to back down when challenged um whereas for the opposite you know the defeated lobster uh 
Uh, it produces a defeating looking, scrunched up, inhibited, drooping, skulking sort of lobster, very likely to hang around street corners and to vanish at the first hint of trouble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and um you know as we know um with with modern human medicine um you know serotonin is one of the neurotransmitters uh highly um relevant to to depression um and he talks a lot about depression in this chapter too but um in this chapter as well but but essentially uh it's the same kind of thing going on someone who's felt defeated um you know, who's been mistreated sometimes very badly or mis- been passed up on a big opportunity, uh, you know, been in a painful breakup. Uh, these are all the kinds of things that can shift our neurochemistry. Uh, li- like for humans, we don't have octopamine, but but dopamine apparently is, is similar to that. But uh, at the very least, it's the serotonin. So, you know, for humans, when, when our serotonin is or when we're defeated, that has an effect on our balance of serotonin, which which also has an effect on uh our mental health um there was so, an, um, yeah it's very interesting yeah i know in some of his other um uh, in some of his lectures and stuff he talks about how some in some parts of the animal kingdom they've found more complicated ways to do these struggles to see who's on top that are less dangerous to right. the animals themselves. wolves is an example where um they um they'll get in a fight but when one of them is like basically defeated the other one puts its jaws on the other one's neck and then, and then they stop the fight. And then it's like, okay, you see that I could have killed you. But I'm not uh, going to kill you. Interesting. Wolves do that. Wolves do that. Interesting. And they say because it's better for the pack that we both yeah. stay alive, right? Because yeah. we can hunt more animals if the both of us are alive. So yeah. I win, and we're still friends. Yeah, kind of yeah. Thing. This is interesting. That stuff. is interesting. Yeah. And he talks about a similar um, kind of thing, just that, like with primates, for instance. Ba- basically, yeah, with with lobsters, it's whoever is most physically dominant get wins and gets the best stuff. But you know, for more complex life forms yeah there's a it's it's more complex and he talks about primates how they're not necessarily the the most successful what does he talk about chimp the most yeah, brutal chimp Z. isn't necessarily the one that that um stays in control it's the ones who can uh form reciprocal coalitions with their lower status compatriots and who pay careful attention to the troops females and infants uh, yeah this sentence is great where it says yeah. the political ploy of baby kissing is literally literally millions of years yeah <laughs> But that is yeah. true. I remember watching a documentary about chimps, and they really are, they can be very violent against other tribes of chimps yeah. and whatever and stuff. Um, but yeah, basically his point that like, it's not like the strongest male tyrant. Once you get to more complicated creatures, like yeah. it's not. And that's the same way in humans as well. Like, right. It's not like the most powerful tyrant, that, because you get enough less powerful people, they'll yeah. take the tyrant down. You know, yeah. it's just like they can't stand the guy, and it's like he's ruining aspects of society or whatever. Sure. Um, yeah. Now that being said, the ones who overthrow the tyrant, they don't stay on top either, unless they yeah. learn the same lesson. Right. right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but this whole serotonin thing—it's interesting um, how uh, this thing. He kind of talks about how it's like a kind of like a self-feeding loop kind of thing. You know, he quotes Matthew where it says. Um, it was the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, yeah the Gospel the New of Testament. Matthew. Yeah, sure, New Testament. To those, the statement of Christ that says, to those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. I, that's probably different than like the King James Version yeah, I'm used a, to. But, yeah. Um, which is something more like to, I don't remember how it states it exactly. But. Anyway, it's, it's the idea that those who have more will be given more. And those are, yeah. yeah. And, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, just the idea that... Um, you, when like like for lobsters and there's a reciprocal thing going on in humans basically that um, when you have like the positive chemicals run through your brain it's a there's a positive feedback loop and you tend to like stay in that place more likely because you get positive feedback yeah you walk around with your feeling confident and people respond to you as if you're confident that's right and then you feel more confident and yeah. it's like kind of thing and the, the the opposite is also true you yep. walk around feeling defeated. And people can kind of tell, and then they treat you like you're defeated, yep. and then you feel more defeated in yep. turn, and you yep. stay like in this defeated place. You yeah, know? It's like, yeah. And I think um, you and I have both experienced that yeah, times totally. in our life. And I think sides, there's but... few people. Well, most. Well, I think everyone by the end of their life will have felt that at some point. Yeah. Uh, some people feel a lot later than others. Some people feel a lot sooner than others. Um, yeah, at least once or twice in my life, I've felt a slight tinge of defeat. 
And, what? Uh, That's it? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard of defeat. <laughs> yeah. I certainly, had some, I certainly had roommates and neighbors who seemed like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not me. And I was like. Hi, serotonin. Top lobster yeah. right here. Always. Like, Whoa. Tell me about that. That sounds horrible. All right. I got to get back to my confident, positive life. <laughs> That's right. And winning at everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It felt like both sides of both of those. You sure, know. sure. You know, I've, you know, um, for for example, even just like in a micro example of this, I feel like, for example, when I go to some social gathering and I have like a few good like interactions at the beginning of the yeah. gathering or whatever, I feel like the rest of my night is like it's a positive social experience for yeah. me. And it's probably because I'm feeling more confident and coming across more confident yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I feel like the opposite has been true as well. You know, I have sure. like the first few kind of not that great experiences. Sure. It's kind of like, yeah, oh, I kind of yeah. like want to get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but so, I, yeah, I would enjoy. argue that also like your general state in life, your yeah. existential state has a big impact on that as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, for sure. That, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So he talks about um, like this very ancient part of our brain. Uh, apparently it's at, at the base of the brain stem. Um, that that keeps track of our position in in the existing dominance hierarchy. This is talking about humans, but uh, presumably also lobsters. Um, and he he describes it as a master control system that modulates our perceptions, values, emotions, thoughts, and actions. Um, um, yeah, basically, like you said, it's paying attention to how we're treated, and then it it with restricts or or. Uh, uh, releases uh serotonin as necessary um so it's, and, and and there's there's a um you know there's a physiological function to that why are you why are you smiling like that i'm just remembering a story that's like, but go ahead finish your okay thought. okay <laughs> yeah i mean there's a physiological reason for that and, and survival uh purpose for that which is that um when we have less serotonin we're more on alert uh, I mean, we're more stressed out, but we're also more primed to react to to threats and danger. And you know, if if we remain in that state a long time, then that that becomes depression or anxiety. Um, but but there is, you know, there's survival and evolutionary value to that as well. It's it's that we're primed to keep ourselves alive in the face of of threat. Whereas for yeah. someone, it's interesting because this is. It's about chemicals and it's also about, you know, perception and the two are linked. But for, for someone with high serotonin, you know, not, you know, in, in the general, uh, in the general place, uh, they don't react to the same threats in the same way. It's, it's yeah. not as big of an issue for them. It might just be like a, a blip in the radar or a, road, yeah. a speed bump. And, you know, I've worked with, I work closely with a person that, um, uh, who is very stressed, um, and, uh, and I, I saw this kind of phenomenon play out where small things would would cause this person's all the all of the cards to come crashing down in the house. Um, you know, and and it was it was from my view, who was not as stressed, uh, it was an, it was a gross overreaction. But to this person, it was um, you know it was they were they were primed for, to react this way because they were so stressed out about things. Anyway, go ahead. We'll re- you- yeah. Well, one of the, what you said reminds me of this quote. Um, the poor and the stressed always die first in greater numbers. They're much more susceptible to non-infectious diseases like cancer, diabetes, oh, and heart yeah. disease. When the aristocracy catches a cold, as it is said, the working class dies of pneumonia. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, man, it's bad to be on the bottom. Um, yeah, yeah. It's just when you were talking about um, uh, you know knowing your place in the hierarchy, kind of thing. I remember. Uh, I think that's especially a kind of a male kind of thing too. Like, um, I remember hearing a. A, I'm not uh, so sure, but yeah, go ahead. Okay, it might not be, um, but um, you can offer some counterpoints. Uh, but I remember uh, being at like this little conference where Matt Townsend was talking about the top three reasons why f- females communicate, like their purposes in communication. Mm-hmm. The top three for males, and for males, Matt like, Townsend, he's like a yeah, he's like a coach and he's a HR expert dude, something, something like that. Like I've that. heard him speak; he's very good. I can't remember. Anyway, he, go on. He's a good speaker. But for males, like the top one was uh was um like kind of knowing your place in the pecking order kind interesting of how you stack up against the other guy interesting it's your it's the it's the main reason uh this is the main thing you're trying to figure out when you're communicating with other guys i guess oh. i don't know about it when you're communicating with women but um and like the last one was like it was like the top three the third one was like to, to connect you know or something <laughs> for women like connect is like the top one 
It was like know your place in the in the hierarchy, um, gather information and connect. Or, yeah, yeah. I can't remember which one was the yeah. top one. Actually, the top it was either it was yeah. either the top one or the top second yeah. one. Well, I, it was the pecking order. I mean, thing. that sounds right-ish to me, at least. I mean, I'm not the expert he was, but um, but I know for like for me when I talk to to my roommates. Usually it's to make jokes or some, say something meaningless. It's not even about communicating anything useful. And and maybe that's part of it too. It's like, I don't know, making sure that we're still like peers in the same level. I don't know. Yeah. It's definitely not to communicate anything meaningful in most cases. <laughs> it's often not a huge amount of connection either. I know yeah. we've talked about on this on this podcast about how as a guy – you can have two guys can have like the most serious, intense discussion of, of their life, and and like it might last like an hour, and then they like barely glance at each other once. You know, like you know what I mean. You know, as their eyes like look at each other for like one microsecond. <laughs> <laughs> the whole rest of the time, they're both like looking straight ahead. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and not so with women. Yeah, yeah. but when I was uh, we, on average. Yeah, when you were talking about pecking order, though, it was reminding me. Um, yeah. I never mentioned pecking order. How yeah, you dare did. you? you Straw man argument. You mentioned higher hierarchies. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm gonna knock down this straw man. Yeah. Uh, no, because like uh, when I was um, one of the places I lived at, we had urban chickens, and um, they, they literally established their pecking order. Like every time. <laughs> Is this a thing? Urban chicken. <laughs> Well, you know, it was like we lived in the city, but we had a bunch of chickens in our backyard. I mean, is this a phrase? If I looked this up on Google, yeah, would it be I, urban chickens? Would that I, be a thing? I think so. Hey, man, in Phoenix, <laughs> so I lived in Phoenix for a long time. Like, in Phoenix, they actually have a place called the Chicken District. And oh, wow. And chickens roaming wild. That is weird. And the, they're, like, protected in this area. Weird. And, yeah, there's, like, little groups of chickens walking around. It's kind of like Hawaii. In Hawaii, you have that, too. Like, huh. it's just chickens. But, but anyways... um. I'm not sure how the chicken district got started. I suspect that it's just that some people didn't want to take care of their chickens, so they let them out of the Yeah, place. and they were left unchecked, and now yeah. they're we, subservient to the chickens. Yeah, but occasionally we would, like, get a new chicken and introduce it into, like, our flock or whatever. Oh, because you had your own flock, right? We had our own little flock, I guess. I guess. Yeah. I never really called it a flock, but at any rate, um, and every time you would introduce a new chicken, there would be a whole new establishment of the pecking order to see, uh, like, where does this chicken fall? Yeah, how tough is and this chicken? Room? Yeah, you know, and sometimes some chickens. I was just the reason I was smiling earlier is because I was remembering that we introduced this one chicken, and it, like, and the top chicken that was the chicken before was uh, uh, was named Sonia, and um, she was like a red hen, and and so she goes up to this the new chicken to like kind of like tell her what's up, and uh-huh. and and this new chicken like really fought back with like a you know she really like stood her ground and was like you know, uh-huh. don't, don't be getting all up in my grill. Uh-huh. Kind of thing, and and I was just thinking, I was trying to remember what that chicken's name was, and in my mind, I was thinking it was Chitara, and then I was like, did we really name a chicken after a Thundercat? I couldn't remember. We may have. Um, anyways, and I wrote, we, we had a lot of chickens die, unfortunately, because from had, not from, pecking order, not stuff. from pecking oh, order okay. stuff, but from like just random chicken sicknesses and uh, stuff. And maybe because they were on the bottom of the of the order. Yeah, it's possible, and I don't know. I don't know. Everyone. I mean, one, all one all day. all chickens and all humans, even the top lobster dies, right? At some point, <laughs> they did. And every time a chicken died, I wrote a chicken obituary and uh, and kind of emailed it out to the roommates and to our next door neighbors who who were kind of helping us out with the chickens. Uh huh. So I'm gonna go look that up later. And okay. See if her name really well, was well, that Chitara. was a delightful <laughs> anecdote, barely related to this, but delightful <laughs> it, it, nonetheless. Yes, it was barely related, and I make no claim that that was. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um. But anyways, the picking order thing though really is uh, it is a real thing in the animal kingdom. You know, it, it was yeah. a real thing with the chickens. Yeah, uh, and yeah. you know, it, it, in a, in a different way, uh, it's it's a thing with humans too. Yeah. Um, you know, I I don't know if we've talked about this much, but uh, if not, we will at some point. But just as far as like, I don't know, did we talk about this in attractiveness? Just the fact that like for women, uh, a man's social status. Yeah. is more of a factor in like determining whether they're attracted to him or not. Yeah. Uh, and a lot less so for men. Um, yeah, and a guy can feel, because of that, a guy can feel uh, big shifts in yeah. how attracted women are to him in yeah. different social settings, you know. Um, mm. So you yeah. might, you're in some workplace where you're like top dog or something. Uh-huh. You might be getting a lot more attention. You go to some other place and you're not. Yeah, and like what gives? You're I'm like, cool. 
And whereas with a female, a lot of the initial attraction of a guy is just physical. Uh, it's just it's the initial attraction. And yeah. so women don't experience those big shifts as often when they go from place to place, you know, different settings. Interesting. They, they, it's, kind of, it's kind of more static for them, you know, because it's more based off of the physical attraction initially, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. I, I guess that's true. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Well, back to our outline here. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things you run into is like, okay, well, what do you... Obviously, if you're feeling like you're like loaded up with uh, serotonin, or no, not serotonin. Um, if yeah, you're not loaded yeah, with serotonin. Yeah, high serotonin. High ser- like with lobster with high serotonin is the one that's cocky, strutting. Yeah, so, yeah. So like if you're feeling like you're loaded up with a lot of, load of serotonin and you're like, uh, you know, doing great. Yeah, great, top lobster. You know, and there, top, and it's top inter- lobster. I mean, he talks about how, you know, people with low serotonin, so the people who feel at the bottom, they're more likely to focus, much more likely to focus on, you know, short term things because um, they're always stressed. Right. So they're always bracing for the next catastrophe. Yeah. Um, and, and they're more likely to perceive things as catastrophes, as we've said. Um, you know, they're they're more likely to, uh, you know, delve into alcohol and, yeah. and cocaine. Um, more likely to become addicted. Um, yeah, you're more likely to feel hopeless and do, make stupid decisions. Exactly, you know? to get in relationships that are bad, that are doomed from the start, because you're yeah. desperate and and you need, um, you need something. Um, yeah, and it, it's the person with a high serotonin who's more who has more confidence, who's more likely to have success, you know, more likely to live in the good neighborhoods, get the good jobs, um, more likely to be able to and inclined to consider the long term. Um, And and you see this, like you see this in people who are poor, for instance, you know, they're they're more stressed for sure. And, and, and unfortunately, like, uh, I mean, there's been studies on like savings rates among, among the impoverished and they just, they don't save for the future in part because they don't have that much to save if anything yeah. and in part because it's just not on their minds yeah um yeah power is a bad place to be yeah you know it's uh, bad for a lot of reasons it's literally yeah. bad for your health yeah you know yeah um but so but okay then if you're feeling like you're you're at the bottom of the barrel then, then you're doomed <laughs> yep sorry <laughs> That's the end of our podcast. Yep. Bucko. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> this was only like a cheerleading message for those right. who are at the top. For those those blessed few, yeah. yeah. No, um yeah, if you're at the bottom I, I mean you're not you're not stuck there, but um but but it's a real thing to be at the bottom. Yeah. You know, it's a real thing to be depressed, it's a real thing to feel uh you know, defeat. Um and sure. To reconsider your place in the universe, um, you know, reconsider your opportunities. Um, yeah, I think one of his points is that um, if you're if you're feeling at the bottom, like your brain is kind of working against you a little bit. Yeah. Um, because it it's considering that you're in like a high stakes, dangerous situation kind right. of thing, and so your brain chemistry is kind of like a little bit working against you. And so his point, kind of as a psychotherapist or mm-hmm. uh, is that um i can't remember if, if that's exactly what his uh title is but um but anyways um he gives some like feedback that he get he gives some some ideas that he gives that he's given to a lot of his clients yeah and for example one of them is just hey get on a good sleep schedule like get get on a routine yeah you know um and that like is something that that helps it can um the more erratic you get and, and yeah. i've experienced this too like me too when you're in kind of the when you're feeling like things aren't going that great you like have a tendency towards like erratic sleep schedules yeah. erratic eating yeah and it doesn't help like that's right in fact it, it kind of exacerbates the situation, it does yeah you know? yeah i find with every time that i've gotten uh well that's a long story i do find that w- when i get into a funk uh, that that an erratic sleep schedule is almost always a, a factor. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's not the only one, but it is a factor. Yeah. Same here. There was this time when I was in between jobs. Uh, I don't remember. I mean, I don't remember how long. And also, my car, like something had the cylinder head had cracked on my car. For those of you who don't know what that means, and that's like a big, huge repair. And I was like upset. I don't remember. Prayer? How, uh, Problem? No, it's a. 
What did I say? It's a big, huge prayer. Did I say prayer? You say big, huge prayers because you, you need a miracle. to <laughs> Anyway, it's a big problem is what you're saying. Go on. I have no idea. No, and I, no I said it's a big, huge repair. Repair. repair oh, yeah. repair. I'm sorry. sorry I was I'm trying sorry. to figure out why in the world would I sorry. have Sorry. Okay, prayer. please continue. Um, but anyways, I don't remember how old I was, but I was like kind of upset at my dad because because um, uh, he always wanted to be like super involved in fixing the car and, and I was like I want to do this on my own I'm capable mm -hmm. kind of thing and but my friends were like making fun of me because they're like you wake up at like 11 you sit around and then you start working on your car at like four it's like your car has cinder blocks <laughs> but it was I really was I was like going to bed super late waking yeah. up meandering around working yeah. on my car for a few hours kind of looking for a job yeah you know and eventually I got that job yeah. and I was okay but yeah Routine. It's like it makes a big difference. You know, when that's you have right. a regular job, that's right. That's one advantage is that yeah, you're the, usually the, stuck in some routine, and that is helpful. And that the predictability of it, and the stability, and the simplicity, even like those are all conducive to to good health. Yeah. Um, yeah. It says that that can be perceived most clearly in small children who are delightful and comical and playful when they're sleeping, and even eating habits are stable, and horrible and whiny and nasty when they're not. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. He that one thing he points out too is that he he thinks that um and I've heard other people say this, your waking up time is more important than your going to bed time. Yeah, that's interesting. That if you wake up on a set schedule, um, you know, it helps you yeah. know that routine. Yeah. Um, and I found for me when I've been self-employed, um, I'm a night owl and I love to stay up and and. You know, if I don't have to wake up, if I don't have a meeting or whatever at a certain time, then I'll say, oh, I can stay up later because then I can sleep in later. Yeah. And I found that's not good. I know. No, I'm a, a night owl as well. And I feel like a lot of my family are night owls. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm which, which tangentially has to do with uh, the, the individual length of our circadian cycle, which can which is not necessarily 24 hours. Sure. No, sorry, go on. I yeah, learned that from a sleep study specialist. Yeah, I actually remember hearing of some study where they put these people in a house and they, they blocked off all natural light entirely. And so they never knew like when the sun was up, when mm -hmm. it was down. And that people fell into like 26-hour schedules. where it was On like, average? On average, they would stay awake for yeah. like 17 hours, sleep for eight, okay. 17, eight. Right? Interesting. Something like that. Wait, 17 and 8. Okay. Isn't that right? Isn't that 25? Well, 25. 25. 25. Is yeah. that what I said? You said 26. Okay, well, that's 25. interesting, yeah. Cause, and 26. for some people, their cycle is, is less than 24 hours, and those are the people that want to go to bed earlier. Yeah. yeah. But so it was like they were shifting an hour every day. Yeah. Anyway, I day. sidetracked you on something. Yeah. Um, I don't remember what... what... No, exactly the record will was. show this as well, that this. when Bryce interrupted Paul, that he was going to say something <laughs> profound about something else. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember something about waking up or going to bed, but I'm a night owl. You were just talking yeah. about your skating rhythm. Yeah. That was basically what I was talking about there was that little experiment there. Yeah. But um, cool. I'm a night owl, and I've tried to like get up earlier, and I feel like I can only get mine to a certain level. I feel like I, it seems like I can get usually to about 11. If I try to go earlier than that, I start having sleep problems. Like my body's mm. rebelling. Like stop doing this to me. Yeah, I want to be up late. Yeah, like I don't want to. I like doing what I want when I want. Yeah, you don't own me. The the way my body will rebel though is that it'll let me sleep for the first four hours, and then I'll say, okay, now I'm gonna wake you up for three or four hours in the middle of the night, bucko. <laughs> and now what are you gonna do? You're too tired to work. Uh -huh. You're just gonna lay here and uh -huh. be miserable, and you're like, "Okay, I relent. I'll yeah, go to bed I'm, earlier." No, no. And then I'm like, "Okay, I'll go to bed at midnight again. I'm sorry, I'm sorry." And I'll go to midnight and I'll sleep a good straight eight hours. There we go. My body's like, "Thank you." Yeah, um, my circadian rhythm. You know? Yeah, nice. I don't know. So anyway, okay. So so that's one of the things he recommends, you know, for for getting out of depression and sure. Could, I think priming yourself to like get out of the bottom really is is have some you know a predictable schedule especially when it comes to sleep sure while we're on before we move on mm -hmm. to the next topic while we're on the topic of waking up uh might i put a plug in here for um our next sponsor no i don't know <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> alarm clocks <laughs> alarm clocks <laughs> no this is a, this is also an unpaid uh advertisement um but I've heard that, so, you know, the way your sleep rhythm works is that, you know, you go in and out of these deeper uh, cycles. You're going through these cycle, sleep cycles, right? Yeah. And so you're going in and out. of You go into REM, and then you go into deep sleep, mm -hmm. and then you go back into REM kind of thing. 
you know, when you wake up in the kind of in the middle of a cycle, it's usually when you like remember your dreams because um, usually if you go all the way through the cycle, your brain knows that I can flush all that stuff because those dreams aren't really important to yeah. remember. They're not good. They're not important for long-term memory. But I've heard that when you get j- a sound alarm will jerk you out of a deep sleep mm. or out of REM sleep, and you'll often wake up feeling less restful. Yeah. Whereas some kind of alarm that will wake you up when you're at the top of your sleep cycle will you'll wake up feeling more restful because if you like finished another complete cycle, I think each cycle is like about an hour and a half. And so, like, for example, for a while I was using a light alarm when I needed to huh. wake up at a certain time. And I would set it for about, like, a half hour before I actually needed to be up, just in case. But to give me, like, about a half hour window. And all it would do is turn a light on. And then I would just wake up. Your room lights? It, or does it have its own light? Yeah. I had a like well, blue I, light or something? All I really had, all I really had it was, like, a... Uh, a big light that was like on a timer. So I was like, oh, okay, at 6.30, this light just turns on. And then you don't know, ner- that normally doesn't like jerk you out of sleep. But, yeah. but eventually the light, if when you're at the yeah. top of your sleep schedule, the light will be like, hey, it's light outside. Yeah. I can see it through the eyelids. <laughs> it's like, even though they're closed, it must be time to wake up. <laughs> and then it gives you all the the wake up chemicals. do 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 and, and in your mind, the birds start chirping, uh-huh. and then you like leap out of bed. Uh, that's not exactly how it goes. Uh-huh. But it's a little bit better than. And, that. and then the little birdies come in and, and they bring your clothing to you. <laughs> yes, if you're Cinderella, I guess. <laughs> but it's definitely better than like like there's a skit I was watching this comedy skit, and it was like the guy who invented the alarm, and they were like, and he was like, and when the first guy was like, yeah, we'll make it soothe the music, and the other guy was like, no, we'll make it this noise, eh, 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 uh-huh. which is like what a lot of alarms are. It's yeah, like super annoying. Yeah, it? mine is. Annoying. So, anyway, that's just a plug yeah. for and I found that, alarms. that uh, Paul is so photosensitive. He's like a plant that, um, and, and actually, I do this now too. <laughs> but like, he blocks. He has these light blocking curtains, and if one photon reaches his eyelid and like squeezes through <laughs> his eyelids, then they'll like wake him up immediately. Yeah, it's like time to wake up. It's true. I do have like. Um, I have like electrical tape over like every electrical light in my room, and <laughs> so that the lights don't. <laughs> yeah, you know what's in it? what? Yeah. Another thing, even even my like desktop computer. Uh huh. Um, so the you turn it off, but there's a, there's some little light in on there that's still on right. when I've got it plugged in. It's like right. some little green light in there. I'm, I don't know what it is, but anyway, so what I ended up doing in the end is I like actually just put my entire desktop on a power strip. So I actually like cut off the power to my desktop so that, oh. that little light goes off too yeah um interesting but anyways but you know that's actually one thing that's supposed to help you get better sleep is yeah. you know make your environment really dark yeah you know, make it like a cave yep. basically. cold so, and dark yeah. yeah so anyway okay good one so mm-hmm. regular sleep uh okay the next thing is he says is is to get a breakfast eat a breakfast that's high in fat and protein and low in sugar uh, and this is something that pe- people more knowledgeable and, and experienced could talk to more effectively than us. But yeah, essentially, yeah. like we all know, your diet affects how you feel. Um, and we know that yeah. we live in a carb-heavy world. Yeah, uh, carbs are they're cheap, they're plentiful, they're easy to obtain, and they taste good, right? But but they cause our blood sugar to spike, and then we have a dip, and then we feel terrible afterwards. And this is actually <laughs> with this job I'm working now, this happens to me a lot because they try to incentivize with us with food and unfortunately for me that's very effective um at least in getting me to eat more food well yeah anyway it's effective um but it's not healthy yeah I was... uh, yeah no, i'll feel terrible by the end of the day um yeah yeah me too like um definitely i don't know maybe that's more good. than just blood sugar <laughs> maybe it's deeper but sorry go ahead yeah well, no, I'm a sucker for like if there's like a donut in the counter on the morning, it, then it's hard for me not to use yeah. it. Yeah, but saying. donuts presumably those are high in fat. They and, are high in they're fat. They're probably high they're in high sugar, high sugar too, too. But yeah, I was just telling Bryce today because we helped somebody move a couch, and they uh, they gave us dinner afterwards, and um, they gave us donuts for dessert, and and on the way home, I. I said, it was the strangest thing. The strangest thing. My donuts disappeared. They kept having one bite at a time. Yeah. <laughs> and like I kept – I was driving us home and I kept looking over and like – and Paul's like, what the heck happened? And then someone had come and taken a bite 
one bite after another from his donut. They were magic donuts. And <laughs> what was even strange about it is the person was so sneaky that they left a little bit of glaze on my lip. <laughs> they, they framed you. <laughs> yeah, that was strange. It wasn't me. That I was said, really strange. As I held the empty napkin. Yeah, that was, that was uh, uh, the perfect crime. Anyways, so. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, don't let it happen to you. Yeah. Don't be framed yeah. for eating a donut. Um, I actually really like this uh, this statement though, where he says because this is really interesting to me. I've had many clients whose anxiety was reduced to subclinical levels merely because they started to sleep on a predictable schedule and eat breakfast. Interesting. Yeah, it really is. Like, um, I don't know. Another interesting statement, and and you know, one of the things I like that Jordan Peterson does is that he'll talk about how he'll have clients who. They'll say they're depressed, and he'll say, well, tell me about your life. Mm-hmm. And they'll tell him about their life. They'll tell him about their lives, and there will be, like, a lot of bad stuff going on. Sure. And he'll say, you're not depressed. You just have a crappy life right now. <laughs> and he'll say, we need to do th- things to try to fix that. Like, it's yeah. not that you need – I mean, no, I'm not saying depression is a real thing. And he yeah, wouldn't I've, say that I've either. been clinically depressed. Like, yeah, where it was, sure. it was the chemicals were out of whack, and, yeah. and the only – it was not just a changing my circumstances. Yeah. I need to change my chemicals. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But but so, it's complicated. So that's it's not always thing. just that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like, um, oftentimes probably like a good first thing would be to, to, to maybe make an attempt at checking some of that stuff, you know, and being yeah. like, well, maybe let me change some of the stuff about my lifestyle right now and sure. see if that makes a difference. You know? Yeah. Exercise is a huge thing too. I mean, he huge. doesn't talk about he it. Yeah. But, but it, exercise is like a miracle drug. It is like... And it's a miracle drug that I never want to take. Yeah. But except when I've just taken it, and then I'm like, "This is the best thing ever." Yeah, exactly. Check on me two days from now or the next day. It's like, nope. Yeah. Nope. I'll just sit here feeling crappy for all that sugar I ate at work. You're like, I'm sitting here waiting to get a Facebook kit from one more like. <laughs> there we go, and that will make like. me feel better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, anyways. Yeah. Yeah, stuff. it is interesting stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, another thing he recommends, and you, you kind of talked about this earlier, but just the, the, the reality of, of feedback loops. Um, <clears throat> uh, he says, depressed people, for example, can start feeling useless, burdensome, grief-stricken, and pained, and this makes them withdraw from contact with friends and family, and then the withdrawal makes them more lonesome and isolated and more, more likely to feel useless and burdensome. Uh, then they withdraw more, and in that manner, depression spirals and amplifies pretty self-explanatory um yeah yeah that's a tough that's a tough one i mean i think yeah. um you know when you're in a place like that and you can have like an honest conversation with someone who's it's a safe conversation you can just talk about how you're feeling i think that's often a good thing yeah. to kind of get you at least out of you know aloneness in your cave you know mm-hmm. um kind of thing but it is true like when you're like feeling really bummed like you don't want to go socialize, you know. Right. And so, like, yeah, or go you can't, exercise. You don't want to go exercise either. But you kind of need to. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um. Uh, again, if if you're clinically depressed and your chemicals are out of whack, we're not making any magic guarantee that that going to socialize or getting exercise will will solve it for you. But it could be part a part of the solution. Yeah. Another thing he talks about is just is just. Stand up straight with your shoulders back, literally. Well, I mean, okay. Some literally this, and figuratively. Some of this is kind of figurative. Like, yeah. to accept, stand up straight with your shoulders back. To stand up straight with your shoulders back is to accept the terrible responsibility of life with eyes wide open. <laughs> this is the part that was making me think of um, <laughs> of this uh, Werner Herzog reads children's books because <laughs> there's this... Uh, there's this. He's a famous yeah. German director. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> with, 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 He's kind of scary. He played a villain in in the first Jack Reacher movie. Uh, he huh. he's pretty scary. Yeah, he also was... narrated Grizzly Man, which is such a sad movie. Anyway, go on. Yeah, he narrated one that was about penguins too. Uh-huh. Um, and anyways, um, so if you have if at some point if you haven't seen this, you should definitely YouTube. Um, just Werner Herzog reads Curious George because it's like he takes this like innocent children's book and he, he turns it into this like scary story. <laughs> And yeah, and uh, I don't know. He just like makes it like yeah. so serious yeah. about like just like very deep ponderous yeah. stuff. Yeah, but it is like a uh, yeah terrible responsibility. The terrible responsibility. Of life. So I'm gonna back up a little bit actually. Okay. So so he he says some other things that the I think are interesting. Well, well, one he, in the book he gives the example as far as like feedback back loops. He talks about how 
uh, and presumably based on his own experience as a as a clinician, but um, you know, a, of a woman, and it's usually women who get um, like an anxiety disorder. It's not that men aren't susceptible to or disorders as well. It's just anyway, um, who you know is currently in her life. She's got a lot of stress, and then she she is trying to find a parking spot at the mall, and and something triggers her, and she has you know panic attack, and it's just a very unpleasant experience, and she has to to withdraw, you know, and then, um, she talks to the doctor, the doctor says, Oh, it was probably just a panic attack, you know, and you're, you're fine. And then, and then she goes back and has the same experience. And so now she and her brain tell her, well, her brain has now decided like, Oh, this is not a safe place. And yeah, you should withdraw. You should run away. Um, and, um, and that kind of spirals that, you know, she'll have that kind of, um, negative experience at, at some other public place and that's very stressful. Mm. And so she, she with, withdraws and eventually she has to just stay at home. And even that is, mm. is anxiety inducing. And I've actually experienced that as well. Um, yeah. And I've had panic attacks too. And, and yeah, it was very, uh, um, uh, scary. And, uh, mm. I mean, fortunately it didn't turn into agoraphobia for me, but, mm. um, and that's what, that's the one where you just stay home all the time. Yeah, agoraphobia is fear of public places. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, so that's interesting. Okay, and he also says this. He says, <laughs> and I appreciate his directness on this. You know, it's it's, but it's it's hopeful directness. He says, maybe you're a loser. You're talking to people who are at the bottom, your bottom lobsters. He says, maybe you're a loser, and maybe you're not. But if you are, you don't have to continue in that mode. Uh, maybe you have a bad habit, or maybe you're, you're even just a collection of bad habits. You know, maybe you were bullied. Um, maybe you've had, you know, some, some truly, uh, big setbacks. Um, but you don't have to continue in that, in that kind of mindset and that kind of state. Um, circumstances can change and, and your mindset can change as well. Um, yeah, he often gives this, uh, idea of like, if, if you need to start somewhere, just start by cleaning up your room, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of become kind of a, a funny meme that people kind of joke around about a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but and I and maybe there was one of the lobster t-shirts that was like also talking about cleaning up your room or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, you know, he talks about if you, I don't know, it's kind of like you you start to change something. He often says this in like his lectures. He'll be like, "Well, start with one thing today. Yeah. That if you do it, it's gonna make uh, your life a little bit better tomorrow." You know, and like yeah. that's an example of something that's actually yeah. do that. You know, one thing that's going to make your day tomorrow like less painful or you know less yeah. of a bummer. Yeah, there are things you can do to affect yeah. that often. Yeah, you know, I mean, and because feedback feedback loops can can be advantageous or not. Yeah. Um, you know, if if you clean up your room, you know, you might have a small sense of accomplishment, and that can help you feel a little more able, more willing to to do something. You know, the next time and the next time after yeah. that. Well, you know, you talk, you talk, Brass, a lot about like, um, uh, like internal versus external uh, locus of locus control. Of control, yeah. and I think this is kind of like an example of that. Yes, is that like, you know, if you start feeling like, well, it's all outside of my control. It's it's just, yeah, my life is crap, and it's nothing I can do about it. There's right. nothing I can do about it. And yeah. Yeah, that's a bad place to be. Yeah, but and and that's learned in psychology. They yeah. call that learned helplessness. Sure. Exactly. Yeah, and so well, if you need to be like, what about Bob, and take baby steps, you know, yeah, uh, to to get out of that place first, fine, you know. But yeah. um, it's not a place that you have to stay. Um, I remember one time I was reading um, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know, mm-hmm. and that uh, there's a lot in that book that's about like just taking control of your situation and yeah. doing things, like setting goals in ways that like, no, you're in charge of this and yeah. you can affect it and. And I was yeah. having interesting dreams around that time. I'd heard that um, when you have dreams that you're like in a, a passenger in a car or something, it's supposed to be symbolic of you're not feeling. Uh huh. If you're a passenger, and, yeah. And I started having these dreams where I was where I was like more and more in control of some vehicle. Uh huh. Until like the last one was like me driving the Batmobile. <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyways, yeah. I'm not sure that was really me feeling more in control, but maybe it was. Maybe, you know? maybe. Because yeah. I was like setting goals and stuff. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to change this, you know? Yeah. I mean. So so along those lines, he says that your nervous system responds very differently when you face the demands of life voluntarily. So that's yeah. kind of an internal locus of control. Um, so it, when when you face them voluntarily and, and deliberately, right, as if you had a say in your circumstances, which you do, um, that, that you'll find yourself responding to a challenge instead of bracing for a catastrophe. Sure. Um, but to get to that point, you have to face your, circumstance, face your circumstances themselves and face yeah. the reality that you have some role in this and, and that things could change Yeah, uh, for the better, actually. Yeah. And some things certainly are outside our control, but for sure. some things are, you know, yeah. so it's like some things are outside of sometimes or some things are inside of it. We yeah. gotta focus on things that we can't change. Yeah. So, um, let's see. He talks about your posture, like, yeah. though, though not just figuratively, but like attend carefully to your posture, Physically, quit yeah, your physical and posture. around, yep. you know, speak your mind. You know, like, well, um, put your desires forward as if you had a right to them, at least the same right as others. Walk tall and gaze forthrightly ahead. Dare to be dangerous. Yes. Yeah, encourage the serotonin to flow plentifully through the neural pathways, <laughs> desperate for its calming influence. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Some of that kind of reminds me of, like, the Superman poses and all that stuff. The sure. woman pose, sure. like, before you go into an interview or whatever, yeah. you know, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, you know, and but. I think that's good. It's the most helpful when you actually believe it. Right. Yeah, and, and when your exactly. your other behaviors match that, because sure. if you're just doing a strong pose and then nothing else has changed, it's not going to it's gonna, not going to change anything. Yeah, true. Uh, or at least not not in a lasting way. Um, you know, he says some other stuff, too. He says, uh, and we're just kind of in closing, um, he says people, including yourself, will start to assume you're competent and able once you start to stand up straight with your shoulders back. Uh or, or at least they won't assume the the opposite, you know, that you're not competent and not yeah. able. And you'll feel less anxious, and therefore you'll be more able to pay attention to subtle social cues yeah. uh, because you're not focused on, on your pain and insecurity as much. And that'll increase your your uh, successes in, in interacting with other people. Uh, you'll be able to communicate effectively, uh, you know, to have a more positive and productive human interaction, which in turn increases your chances of good things um, good opportunities uh, showing up, and also when those opportunities do come, they will be more uh, enjoyable and positive for you. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know Lisa Snell, she's a dating coach. I remember in one of her books, she talks about she she actually talks a lot about like posture specifically. Yeah. She's like, yeah. do these things yeah. about your posture, and you'll, you'll yeah, and appear it's more confident it's so obvious, right? This is one of the first things we'll notice about people is how do they conduct themselves. Yeah. And, you know, and if. On average, if you're a woman, you'll also notice how they how they dress, right? And yeah. some of these other more social subtle cues as well. Um, I also but, find, but which which give which send a signal about um, how a person thinks about themselves, right? Yeah. Anyway, go on. Um, so it's good to like actually have good posture. Um, yeah. I also like to verbalize this thing. Some people say like, "How are you doing?" And I'll just say, "Confident and able." <laughs> Okay, but if your if your posture and your outward appearance and behaviors don't match it, then people know you're lying to them. But when I say things like that, then I really feel like, yeah. so. Then I'm like, uh, then they just like kind of think. It's I don't actually say yeah. stuff like that, but just yeah. now that we're talking about it, yeah, I yeah. think I'm going to yeah. for fun okay. and see okay. how. Okay, well that's good. Yeah, uh, we don't have time for another tangent, but uh, so. well, I'll say it anyway. Okay, There's this funny more. TV show. It's called Nathan for You. It's this guy. Uh, it was on Comedy central it's not on the air anymore but like he he passes himself off as a, a business consultant to small businesses and he gives like terrible advice and then has these elaborate schemes to like help them increase sales or, or whatever and it's always it doesn't work mm. um anyway he has this one thing where he's testing whether confidence can can win you a job in a job interview and it, 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 he tests by having the seven-year-old kid speak into a microphone, and he's wearing an, and Nathan's wearing an earpiece in, a, in an interview, and uh, he'll just repeat whatever the kid is saying, wow, and then wow. afterwards he'll ask if he got the job, yeah. just based because he'll comport himself confidently, but just his words are totally stupid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's even one where he has a turtle at the microphone. What the heck? Okay, and so of course he doesn't say anything, but he's looking confident. Didn't get him the job. So Paul, words might matter too, and behave. Might too. <laughs> okay, give them that. Get to that. Yeah. Anyway, that's hilarious. I okay. Like that story. Well, Paul, any parting thoughts? No, that's all I got. You know, I think. I mean, I think the the main parting thought for me is that 
hey, there's some practical things in here that if, you're, Absolutely. if you feel like you're at the bottom of the barrel uh, or, you know, you're not in the at the level of the barrel you want to be or whatever, yeah. um, you know, hey, start by trying yeah. to fix your sleep Which, schedule by the way, breakfast. that perception may be fairly accurate. You know, maybe yeah, people, sure. li- like I said, maybe you are a loser or maybe at least people perceive you as a loser or maybe you have bad habits. I mean, you... You surely do, actually, because we all have bad habits. We all have <laughs> bad on. habits, and, and, and maybe you really are in like a bad place right. in your life right now, or something, right. or maybe you've been in one for many years, or whatever. Right. But um, but yeah, you know, fix fix trying to fix your sleep schedule and eat, eat healthy breakfast, and I I would throw exercise in there. It's huge too. Yeah. But like um, these things can help, and and that hey man, you know, inch your way back to a better place you can. Yeah, you know? and, and believe that you have value. Even if people are not treating you like you do, you know, to behave as if you do. Yeah. And to believe it, um, that that can be powerful. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and, and it, it would be work. It, uh, it's always going to take work to, to change. But yeah. But uh, as Jordan Peterson would say, um, you know, to remain in, at the bottom is not good. That's not good. No, exactly. It's, it's <laughs> not a good place to be. <laughs> it's literally bad for your health. Yeah. Whereas it's great to um, be not at the bottom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also do yourself a favor and go watch that Curious George read by Werner. There Hansel. we go. There we go. <laughs> Anyways, those are my parting thoughts. Okay, good parting thoughts. <laughs> okay, well. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Let's all become top lobsters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll talk to you all, all right. next time. Yeah, take care. Okay, bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing on iTunes or your favorite podcasting app and give us a rating. Thank you.